The suspect, 28-year-old Melissa, uh, Melissa Huckabee, is scheduled to be arraigned today, and an allegation of sexual assault may be added to murder and kidnapping charges. Our Laura Marquez has the latest. Melissa Huckabee's father described his emotional jailhouse visit with his daughter, the first time they've spoken since her arrest. We just kind of sat and cried a little bit. She's not getting much sleep, but, but in spite of all that, she looks, she looks good. Murder, kidnapping, and now possibly rape and child molestation, charges Huckabee's family just cannot comprehend. The young lady I see on film is not, that's not my daughter. Prosecutors could seek the death penalty. The San Francisco Chronicle reporting Huckabee deliberately killed Sandra in the church where she taught Sunday school and her grandfather is the pastor. Soon after Sandra's disappearance, Melissa Huckabee was admitted into the hospital behind me for internal bleeding. Police told ABC News during Huckabee's five-day stay, she was under suicide watch. Jennifer Wadsworth from the Tracy Press spoke with Huckabee shortly before her arrest. I asked her if she tried to kill herself. And she said she didn't want to talk about that, but she didn't say no. The now infamous mugshot of Huckabee stands in stark contrast to photos we found in her yearbook. In an exclusive interview, Huckabee's best friend from high school read notes she said the two girls wrote to each other. Hey, sweetie, I'm glad we're still best friends after all we've been through together. The former classmate wishes she could have talked to Huckabee before all this happened. One phone call to, to call her and see how she was. And that's really hard to know I can't go, go back. Huckabee could be arraigned as early as this afternoon. For Good Morning America, Laura Marquez, ABC News, Tracy, California. Now, to the extent that there is a profile of a child killer, Melissa Huckabee does not fit it. Women are rarely accused of murder, even more so of killing a child. It's one of the reasons why this case is so, so perplexing and why it adds to why it's so disturbing. Well, joining us now is Dr. Michael Wellner, a forensic psych psychiatrist at New York University School of Medicine. Michael, thank you. You always are able to put a, a perspective to it and really help us understand. 93% of these types of cases, murders, are, are men. Less than 7% are women. Well, you know, it, it, experience tells me that that percentage is even lower. And experience tells me as a forensic psychiatrist is that if it's really strange and really peculiar, there's more to the story. Mm -hmm. And I, my instinct tells me to sit back and let the case come to all of us. There are a whole range of possibilities here. I appreciate the authorities are, are holding information tight and not letting it get out but um, when things don't add up it's because things don't add up yeah. and the possibilities here are that that she is as horrible as everybody imagines or uh, she could have gotten in over her head in an interrogation and given statements that incriminated her, herself in a way that are actually inaccurate she may have been an accessory she may have been a witness she may even have been somebody who insinuated herself into a case uh, so so I think that while we're relying on inconsistencies and, and mm -hmm. confessions and we're waiting for more physical evidence, uh, then, then we need to sit back and, and really consider the possibilities. You know, all crimes that we talk about on this program are unthinkable to the rest of us. Sure they are. But they're not unthinkable to the person who's done them. And this may be one of these cases in which the accused, if she's responsible, got involved in something with a child which was unacceptable, but the situation got out of control. And, uh, and a situation that got, got out of control, very reminiscent in a way of John Benet Ramsey. Uh, Why and, do you say and, that? Well, you know, th there are a number of people, including the, the esteemed uh, forensic pathologist Cyril Wecht, who talked mm -hmm. about sexual abuse uh, occurring um, and then death being unexpected. And uh, when death is unexpected in, in some kind of illegal or, or unacceptable or, or taboo activity, what then happens with a fragile person? And how do they react to it? And before you know it, one thing happens and, and gets layered over. So we don't know, as far as I'm concerned, we don't know anywhere near of what we're going to. And that's okay. There's a great advantage to this case. You have a traumatized community, and when you do, police have people available who are willing to talk, and they who are willing to give, get, give information they, because they may help. Why are women, on the whole, more likely, more unlikely to murder than men? Well, you know, it's, it's a, it, it isn't all genetics. We live in a society, unfortunately, in which destruction and the ability to pray uh, uh, and, and to, to use power to knock someone down 
is so tied into a masculine identity. That's not part of what makes women feminine in this culture or in any culture. So there is something about the messages and the roles and the ideas that we send. That, that, that being predatory and, and destroying is not part of femininity in our culture, and, and that's why we don't see it. But we've, we've heard of these infamous cases, Susan Smith, Andrea Yates, mother, ah, mothers who but killed consider their why, own children. But consider why they did it. Uh, all right. Andrea Yates, I worked on the case, I, I examined her, I, I probably spent more time with her as an examiner than anybody. Her decision to kill her children had everything to do with her sense of herself as a failure as a mother and what she believed to be best for, for her children. Um, with respect to Susan Smith, for her it was very much wrapped in the idea of her idealized love. For some people they kill out of, out of relationship conflict. This is a stranger. This is somebody who was, a, who was a neighbor, who was a children's playmate. And so in that sense, even for a forensic psychiatrist, a case like this doesn't add up, especially because an accomplice hasn't been arrested. So this is one of those cases where yeah. the professional says, let's see the evidence come to us. You know, people misunderstand one thing about forensic psychiatry. It's not like Hannibal Lecter saying, here's what I did, let me tell you about it. In this work, you got to go out and get it. You have to draw that work out, and we have to be patient enough to let the evidence come forward. Oh, Michael, thank you, as always, for your insight. Very Appreciate helpful. Appreciate your interest. All right.